The Old Testament lesson for this 14th Sunday after Trinity is recorded in the book of Proverbs, the fourth chapter beginning at the 10th verse. We hear this. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I've taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they've done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they've made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness. They drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is recorded in the book of Galatians. It's the fifth chapter begins at the 16th verse, and Paul writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, the 17th chapter. Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Where are the other nine? Now, not surprisingly, these words of Jesus tend to get a whole lot of play when this text happens to fall on one of the busiest travel-slash-vacation weekends of the entire year. Makes sense. I see why guys do it, right? I mean, where are the other nine? Where is everybody else? Now, before we go any further, we need to figure out who exactly is Jesus addressing when he asks this question. He's certainly not addressing the nine guys who aren't there. I mean, so the simple answer is that he's addressing the lone Samaritan, right? Perhaps that's the case, but I don't think so. See, A, the grammatical construction of that sentence doesn't lend itself to that, that he's addressing the Samaritan. It doesn't seem that way. B, you know, addressing the Samaritan, well, then that puts the Samaritan in the ugly situation of having the answer for those other guys, which he never does. Again, the grammatical construction shows us. This guy never answers for the, he never answers Jesus at all. 
The Samaritan never badmouths those other guys. He doesn't talk about them, nor does he attempt to make excuses for them. All we hear out of the Samaritan's mouth is praise of God, praise that is directed to Jesus Christ. You need to think about that. He praises God by praising Jesus, falling at Jesus' feet, worshiping God by worshiping Jesus. That's a big deal, isn't it? Now, did you ever stop to consider the fact that Jesus could be asking this question to us? He's asking this question for our sake. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that Jesus is asking a rhetorical question here. You know, I, that is a question that doesn't require an answer because, well, the answer is so obvious. Consider the facts. We know why Jesus commands these men to journey to the temple in Jerusalem, to show themselves to the priests. We know why he does it. With this command, Jesus is fulfilling the Levitical law. It comes out of Leviticus chapter 14. The law that states that if a person is healed of some skin disease, like leprosy, they are to show themselves to the priests for examination. Then they are to render the appropriate sacrifice, which restores them to fellowship with their brothers and sisters, and most importantly, restores them back to public worship within God's holy house. Pronounced clean, they can, they can now be in God's holy presence in his holy house. See, Jesus is sending these guys to the priests, to the temple, to show them that he did not come to abolish God's word, but to fulfill God's word. Jesus is sending these guys to the priests as living, breathing, purified proof to the priests of who he is and what he's all about. So in this way, we can't really fault the nine guys for doing what Jesus tells them to do. They were being obedient, right? And, and no doubt they were thankful that somebody even paid attention to them and showed a little compassion to them. I mean, the life of a leper is pretty miserable and lonely. So they were obedient. They all immediately obeyed his command and they went to show themselves to the priests, just like he told them to do. And remember, they weren't healed until they were on their way. They didn't know when or, or even if any sort of healing would take place. Jesus told them the journey, so they did. Now, that kind of blind faith and obedience, that's certainly commendable. And it was in the, the course of this journeying to show themselves to the priest that, that they were healed. But still, only the Samaritan had a saving faith, right? The other nine were healed. They were made well, but they were only made well skin deep. The Samaritan's soul was healed and made well. It was different. His faith in Jesus as God's Messiah in the flesh, as God himself in the flesh, his faith, we're told, made him well and, and whole and complete unto salvation. Or as the original Greek says, that faith saved him. So, you know, where are the other nine? Well, it's obvious from the question then that the other nine didn't have this kind of saving Christ-centered faith. It's safe to say that uh, they didn't recognize God in the flesh in their very presence. Now, there's no doubt that they recognized in Jesus a very powerful man, a, a miracle worker of sorts. Like Nicodemus, they almost certainly recognized the fact that God was clearly on the side of Jesus because, well, no one can do such mighty things unless God's with him, right? So they, they obviously had the faith to call on Jesus when they're suffering and they needed help. They, they knew to call on Jesus. But did they recognize Emmanuel in Jesus? Did they recognize God himself in their midst, not only showing mercy to them, but but also showing great and undeserved grace to them by healing them of their maladies? The answers to these questions seem pretty obvious, don't they? Now, another troubling fact to consider. These men were journeying to the temple in order to fulfill the law, a law that could not save their souls. They were journeying to the temple to satisfy men, to satisfy workers of the law. You know, when you think about all this, Almighty God in the flesh was already with them right there. And yet they were intent on journeying to an empty temple, journeying to where God wasn't. 
You need to remember God's glory, God's Holy Spirit had never returned to the rebuilt temple after the Babylonian captivity. In fact, God's glory, the presence of God, would not return to the temple until Christ himself, God in the flesh, would return. And that was a, an infant return, right? A return that caused Simeon to take him up in his arms and sing praise to God. Here was almighty God in the flesh with these lepers, right where they were at, and they missed it. See, that's what's so sadly ironic in all this. It's obvious from their actions that being restored to the presence of God, which is what that Levitical law was really all about, being restored to be in the presence of God, it really wasn't their primary concern. Because here was God in their presence already. And yet all the other things were coming first. They were too busy to even say thank you. So now comes the really disconcerting part, the really uncomfortable part. What about you? Because you see, that's what this is really all about. Where are you? And I know that sounds like a weird question. After all, you're here, right? I mean, you're not like those other nine who were nowhere to be found when it came time to render thanks and praise to God. And, and, and you're not like all those other people who are too busy worshiping the vacation God and the pool God and the barbecue God and, and all the other gods in, in old Adam's pantheon of selfish idolatry. No, that's not you at all. You're here. What do you mean, where am I? Here I am. Folks, understand, when I ask this question, I'm not asking this only in terms of, a, of mere physical presence. Although, I will say, physical presence is a part of faith and worship. Understand, before I go any further, there is a huge difference between not able to be here and not willing to be here. So when I ask this question and talk about presence, I'm not talking about the sick or the shut-in or those who work on Sundays, those who can't be here. I'm talking about those who simply choose to not be here. You can't say you love God and all his gifts and yet still blow them off, can you? I know we always have plenty of excuses, but facts are facts. By definition, Christians are Christ followers. So if you blow off Christ in order to go your own way, which is a terrible translation here, by the way. Your Lord never says, go your own way. If you blow off Christ in order to go your own way, well, then you're not following Christ, are you? You're not walking in his way. You're not walking in the way of godly wisdom and faith. You're not walking in the way of the Lord. So yeah, you are known by your fruits. And showing up to worship, to be in the presence of God, is a fruit of faith. But I digress. We're not here to talk about those who aren't here, are we? What about us? See, even showing up to worship doesn't always translate into being present with God, does it? Anyone can show up and punch the clock. You can be here and yet still be far away from God at the very same time. You're busy checking your phone. You know, thinking about where you're going to go for lunch or thinking about how you still need to mow the lawn. You'd be here and still miss everything because you're busy wondering why that person's wearing those clothes or you're, or you're busy whispering to your neighbor and you don't hear a thing. So yeah, you can be here physically and still not be here. You can come into the presence of God and, and, and miss it all. So this is why I ask, where are you? Where are you? Not just today, not just physically right now, but always. Where's your heart? Where's, where's the focus of your worship? Maybe the better question is, or who or what is the focus of your worship, your praise, your thanksgiving? Who or what is most important? Examine your life. Examine your life through the lens of those other nine lepers. Again, remember, Jesus asked that question regarding their absence for our sake. Perhaps the better way of getting to the root of all this is by asking the simple question, where is God? Where is God in the midst of your life, in good times as well as in bad times? The answer to these questions is pretty obvious, isn't it? However, I would caution you here. I caution you because I know old Adam tries to comfort himself with the fact that well, God's everywhere. 
Old Adam always tries to comfort himself with the fact that he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and wherever he wants, since God is everywhere. Old Adam likes to believe that he really is worshiping God when he sleeps in or blows off church for the lake. After all, God's everywhere, right? I can worship God in the boat or in the tree stand or in bed or while cleaning the pool or mowing the lawn. I'm not asking about the omnipresence of God when I ask you, where is God? Where is God for you? The answer, the right answer, is right where he tells you to seek him, right where he promises to be. So in that way, I direct you, look to the font. Look to where he is in your midst. Look to this font in your midst. Look to this altar in your midst. Here is Christ for you in your midst. Here is the glory of God for you in your midst. Just consider the facts. Consider what he himself has already told you. Here is the one who's baptized you and washed you, pronounced you clean in the water and blood that's flown forth from his riven side. Here is where he himself calls you and gathers you in order to feed you and nourish you with his own life-giving word and sacrament. He himself says, as often as you do this, remember what I have said. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sin. This high priest of God, this very present high priest of God, has declared you pure. He did it when he says, it's finished. Guys, no one and nothing can ever steal this righteousness away from you. Almighty God himself has justified you. He's, he's declared you holy and righteous in his sight. Not because of who you are, but because of the all-atoning, all-redeeming work and person of your great high priest, of your life-giving sacrifice, the Lamb of God himself, Jesus Christ. And yet I have to ask, is this our top priority? Is this Christ in our midst? It is, is he our top priority always? Do we endeavor to come before him in reverence and humility, praising him for his undeserved gifts of mercy and grace to us? Do we endeavor to come before him at all? Or are there times that we're too busy worshiping our own wants and desires? My fellow redeemed, here's Christ. Here is Almighty God himself for you. In good times, in bad times, rich, poor, sickness, health, wars, rumors of wars, sickness, drought, high cotton, empty shelves, overflowing pantries, overflowing cups and pantries. Here is Christ in the midst of all of it for you. So with all this in mind, you know, knowing and believing all this, I guess the best way to end is by simply asking another rhetorical question. Knowing all this, believing all this, how can you not want to run to him, to fall on your face in thanks and praise and give glory to God? Knowing this, believing all this, recognizing all this, how can you not want to run to him and come before him as you offer up your sacrifice of thanksgiving? Not just today, not just one hour a week, but always. You know, not just today, but, but especially on the Lord's day. My fellow redeemed, those of you who have been washed clean and made alive in Christ, here he is. Here is Almighty God in your presence for you, for your salvation. May this cruciform good news for you, may it be your top priority, always. May Christ for you, Christ with you, be the focus of all your worship, all your praise, and all your thanksgiving, now and into all eternity. Like the psalmist says, right? Give thanks unto the Lord. Always. Give thanks unto the Lord always, in all times, in all circumstances. Why? For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And you, my friends, you are the living, breathing, baptized proof of this. To him be all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Amen.